This is the Garden of Eden, actually in the North Pole. In the book of Genesis, chapter 2, verse 10, it says a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four head waters, and those four head waters are Pishon, Gihon, Tigris, and Euphrates. Fast forward to today, we only know the location of two of these rivers, and logically speaking, the Garden of Eden should exist around that area, right? But what if, when the flood of Noah happened, everything changed? What if the landmarks were shifted, and what we identified are actually in completely different areas? Well, the 15th and 16th century Mercator maps of the North Pole showed a land with four specific headwaters emerging from it, bearing geographic similarities to what was recorded in the Bible. However, in subsequent maps, this piece of land was completely removed and never spoken about again. So, could someone actually be hiding the Garden of Eden from us? And, is the Garden of Eden actually in the North Pole? In the book, could there really be mysterious structures buried at the South Pole? Structures built by an advanced extraterrestrial civilization in our remote past. Buried underneath the ice in Antarctica could well be stone temple constructions. There could be biological material, remains of beings that lived there and could still be there. It could be the greatest reveal in all of human history.
way round the world, we find evidence of pyramid structures, we should start looking at the possibility that there was habitation on Antarctica. Was it a lost civilization? Could it be ancient astronauts? And just maybe the earliest monuments of our own civilization came originally from Antarctica. If this gigantic pyramid in Antarctica is an artificial structure, it would probably be the oldest pyramid on our planet. And in fact, it might be the master pyramid that all the other pyramids on planet Earth were designed uh, to, to look like. There has been extensive research done on pyramids throughout the world in terms of their structure and what it is that they really are. And one of the theories is that pyramids are power generators. And so if you have these pyramids strategically placed around the world generating this charge, it's possible to create a general standing wave around the world that is basically a wireless transmission of energy. It's been theorized that ancient ships, extraterrestrials, and those with high technology could use this interconnected wireless energy system to navigate around the planet. And it makes sense that if there was some kind of worldwide pyramid power grid like this, that Antarctica would have pyramids as well. The whole idea of these pyramidal structures, where did it come from? Because it's not an arbitrary thing. And these structures, they exist worldwide. So, you know, what was the impetus What's the origin? And even more fascinating, did they originate on the Antarctic continent?
According to ancient astronaut theorists, Antarctica may not have been a frozen continent for as long as mainstream scientists suggest. And they say proof can be found by examining a 500-year-old map depicting the continent without any ice. On the bottom of our planet lies the frigid land of Antarctica, the coldest and most inhospitable continent in the world. Mainstream geologists have long believed that ancient humans never settled on Antarctica because of its hostile climate. But incredibly, in 2016, satellite images revealed a curious formation emerging from the ice that some researchers believe could be a man-made pyramid. They look perfect, just like those in Egypt, but they dwarf those in Egypt, like the Great Pyramid. One has a perfectly square base that is two kilometers square in each direction. Is it possible, therefore, that our ancestors did actually reach the Antarctic continent? Tower of Babel likely would have been in modern-day Iraq, somewhere near the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. And now we begin with Shem. Since he is our main and you know, first target for the ancestors of the Afro-Asiatic Semitic peoples, he's the main person we got to look at. Remember, according to the genealogy, the Israelites descend from Shem. This is a paternal lineage, and they would be a Afro-Asiatic Semitic people. I believe Shem and his descendants would have settled around Mesopotamia, specifically in the Persian Gulf. The Persian Gulf is a perfect place for, I believe, uh, Shem and all of them would have been, all the Semites. And uh, here's just another map showing the Persian Gulf and the area where the Euphrates River and Tigris River would have split. And here's just another visual representation. A lot of the early cities were also near the Persian Gulf where the Tigris and Euphrates rivers are. But I believe Shem at some point would have left the Persian Gulf and settled in the future promised land or you know the land of Israel and so there would have been a migration uh, going from the west to the from the east to the west the reason for leaving would have been due to the wickedness of the people but with that being said what evidence do I have that Shem could have settled the future promised land of Israel well, one of the best evidence that I have is that Shem could be Melchizedek. Melchizedek was mentioned in the scriptures as being a king and priest of the city of Jerusalem. Genesis chapter Melchizedek was mentioned in the scriptures as being a king and priest of the city of Jerusalem. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20 says that Melchizedek is the king of Salem, that he is the priest of the God Most High. In scripture, Noah says that blessed by the Lord God of Shem. The God of Shem is very interesting because this leads me to believe the mantle was passed down from Noah to Shem. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Genesis chapter 9 verse 26 the story from creation to the fall of man to the flood and the knowledge of God was likely passed down the people who preserved the truth was from the lineage of Shem this is why there is ancient tradition that Shem is Melchizedek this is from a chabadet.org who named Jerusalem and it says, an ancient tradition tells us that Melchizedek was actually one and the same as Shem, the son of Noah, and that Shalom was, was none other than the very place that Abraham would eventually rename Riah. 
So Shalom is the second half of Ryan plus Shalom, which is Yarushalam. In the Bible, Melchizedek was the king of Salem and priest of El Elyon, tra uh, often translated as Most High God. He is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20, where he brings out bread and wine and then blesses Abraham or Abram and El Elyon. Cheswilic literature specifically Torgrum Jonathan, Torgrum Yashua, and the Babylonian Talmud re represents the name in Hebrew right there as a nickname title for Shem. I believe that's uh, Melchizedek in Hebrew. I don't know about Hebrew correctly. But I believe Eber would have also left Mesopotamia because of the Tower of Babel when they began to build it. The name Eber or Ivri means to cross over. Where, where would Eber have crossed over from? He would have crossed over the Euphrates River, much like Abraham. So Eber means region beyond in the Hebrew. And Eber is a very important figure because we see in scripture the lineage goes from Shem to Eber. In a sense, you can see the passing of the torch. Genesis chapter 9, verse 26. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. In Genesis chapter 10, verse 21. And the children were born also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber. As you can see, it skips our backside and Shelah, and it goes straight to Eber. It's very interesting. Shem or Eber could have been Melchizedek, but one thing is for certain, that I do believe a type of priesthood may have been centered around them, or at least these two men were the essential figures or a continuing of the traditions and oral history of the first chapters of Genesis. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. He And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered our enemies into your hand, and give him a tithe of all. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. In pre-Mosaic times, priestly duties were performed by the father or patriarchal head of the family or tribe. In patriarchal times, uh, the, the office was held and its duties were discharged by those who occupied some sort of headship, and particularly by the father or the chief of the family and of the tribe. Thus Noah, in his capacity of priest and in behalf of his household built an altar unto Yahuwah and took of every clean beast and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar which is mentioned in Genesis chapter 22 verse 13. Melchizedek was priest God of the Most High Genesis chapter 14 18. Isaac built an altar there and called upon the name Yahuwah, Genesis chapter 26 through 25, as did Jacob in Genesis chapter 33, verse 20. In this case, priestly acts were performed by the patriarchs in their capacity as fathers of the family or head of clans. From the beginning, priesthood was in acts of explanation and of worship was thus recognized as a divinitively institution, uh, instituted office. And so, as you can see from the chart above, Noah carried the priesthood through the flood, and it would have been passed on to Shem, then Eber, and then the next one who was alive when Eber died would have been Abraham. And, you know, this is from uh, Adam Becker. I agree that Melchizedek was either 
Shem or Eber. Uh, both were in line of the priesthood and their lives overlap Abraham's. And when he means that, he's saying that, you know, when it comes to the genealogies mentioned in Genesis, that, you know, if you take this to be literal, Shem and Eber both would have lived around the time when Abraham was born. But not only that, uh, Eber actually would have outlived Abraham as well, to a slight degree. But here's the genealogies. You have Shem, and then you have Eber, and then you have Abraham right here. And they actually, you know, Abraham would have been alive. Well, Shem and Eber would have been alive around the time of Abraham. So it's fairly interesting. So either Shem or Eber was, you know, at the time, king of the nearby city of Salem, which was across a small valley from the city of Jeru, which later merged together into a single city, Jerusalem. The priestly line passed from Shem to from Noah, Shem, Eber, and Abraham, then on down the line of Levi. Now, there is an interesting tradition that Eber was not part of the building of the Tower of Babel. And because of this, he kept his Semitic tongue. Uh, this belief is held by both Jews and Arabs. Eber was the first grandson of the first, was the great grandson of Shem and an ancestor of Abraham. The earth was divided in the time of Eber's son Peleg, mentioned in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, as well as 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verse 19, which may refer to the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 10, verse 32, as well as Genesis chapter 11, verse 9. Tradition states that Eber and his descendants refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel and thus preserve the original human language. Might have been Heber. In Jewish tradition, Eber, the, grand, the great grandson of Shem, refused to help with the building of the Tower of Babel, so his language was not confused when it was abandoned. He and his family along ret retained the original human language, Hebrew, a language named after Eber or Heber, also called lingua, ling, lingua humana, humana in Latin. 13th century Muslim historian Abu al Fined relates a story noting that the patriarch Eber, great grandson of Shem, refused to help in the building of the Tower of Babel so his language was not confused when it was abandoned. And so, this is very interesting because this fits perfectly with Eber and his family leaving Mesopotamia and living in the future land of Israel. Like I said, I do believe a type of mantle was passed down from Noah to Shem to Eber and Melchizedek. Genesis chapter 9 verse 26, and he said, Blessed